what a thrill it is to be here in front of a group of people who love trail history. I hope that the, just the few minutes we'll spend together will be of value. I studied maybe one of the shortest trails. It's only 169 miles long and a very short existence. As we'll talk as, we'll talk as I go through the presentation, um, it only ran from like 1860 to 1868, but lots of things happened, lots of freight was hauled, and it's just fun to know about this little trail in Nebraska. The paths of the freighters and the pioneers in their covered wagons allow us to be here today. So here's the topics we're gonna talk about today. Uh, I think you'll find them interesting. This particular slide, or this image here, was published on April 14th, 1860. It comes out of a Nebraska City newspaper. It's the first paper account that we could find about the trail. It wasn't always called the Nebraska City Cutoff Trail. It's been called the Steam Wagon Road. We'll know about, learn about that in just a minute. Uh, the Airline Route, the great route to the Denver coal, uh, Gold Field, several names, the Airline Route. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about what, how this route affected Nebraska City and the impact it had on some pioneers that migrated uh, west in the mid 1860s. So during the mid 1850s, the United States was mired in a serious economic recession. With bank closures, business failures, Nebraska City suffered the same issues. That all changed when the freighting company of Russell, Majors, and Waddell were awarded the government contract to haul uh, supplies to Utah for the Utah War in 1857. That it was a very short war, and because of what happened in the Utah Territory, it was a hard time for the freighting companies um, when they reached that area because um, they weren't welcome. The freighters were welcome, not the army, excuse me. Um, this contract with Russell Majors and Waddell happened in part to, to a gentleman named uh, John Finch Kinney. Now, Mr. Kinney had previously been a judge in the Utah Territory and like many of the federal judges, he didn't stay there very long. He, he came back. Um, but he was appointed as a chairman in a, a group of citizens from Nebraska City to have Alexander Majors and his company choose that city for their freighting. So when Russell, Majors, and Waddell, they received their contract to ship millions of pounds of freight uh, to, the, to Utah, territory. The city leaders promised several items for Russell, Majors, and Waddell. They were going to close up the liquor shops or reduce liquor sales. They were going to upgrade the levee. The town of Nebraska City had a, had a levee. And they were going to develop a shorter route than what's called the Oxbow Trail. The Oxbow Trail went north and then followed the Platte River and then went down uh, near Donovan, Nebraska what Alexander Majors wanted and received the, uh, from Nebraska City that they would find a shorter route uh, for the freighting company. There were some benefits for Nebraska City. These are interesting, not to remember facts and figures, but it's just fascinating. They bought 138 lots. Now at the time, Nebraska City probably had, I'm guessing 1,900 residents. They weren't huge. So this is a big deal. They spent more than $300,000 for land. And you can see on the slide there, they're big enough, you can probably see the amount of money, over $10 million in today's uh, money. That's even a lot for today. And a total of 500 men were hired by uh, Russell Majors and Waddell, the, the freighting company. This is an amazing picture of Nebraska City from 1857. I count 10 freight wagons heading west. I'm calling some of those, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's closer to the river. I think there's wagons there. 
um, they're heading west this year with freight, possibly for the Utah war. Um, it's just an amazing picture. And one of the few that I'm aware of from that early period of Nebraska City. Now there was a broken promise. Due to Nebraska City's inability to find a shorter route uh, to Fort Kearney, Alexander Majors was forced to hire Augustus Harvey, who was actually the city engineer for Nebraska City. He had to pay him to find the shorter route uh, towards uh, Fort Kearney. Harvey used an existing trail from Nebraska City to Olathe. Uh, he used a single bladed plow from Olathe west to, to mark the road. And I have read accounts of others who have used a single bladed plow to mark a road uh, during pioneer times. Now this, I just find this map interesting. You may not be able to see the details. This is located in the Platte County Museum in Columbus, uh, Nebraska. This map was actually traced from an earlier map about the uh, cutoff trail, uh, traced in 1930. The area inside that little rectangular border that you can see um, shows how short the route was. Again, around 169 miles. It was not long. Now interestingly, I don't know if you can see the advertisements on the top and bottom. Somebody paid good money to advertise their businesses. Most of them were located in Nebraska City. Okay, I hope you can see some of this, I hope you can see enough of this map that it makes sense to you. This is the most accurate map that I've found. I'm not a cartographer. This is the most accurate map I've found of the cutoff trail. This comes from a gentleman named David Murphy, who uh, recently retired from uh, History of Nebraska, or, or what was called Nebraska State Historical Society. A copy of this map was purchased by my wife and I in 2012 when we first began our research into this trail at the Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center. If you want to go see un trails on virgin uh, soil, it's there. This is 850 acres where this Audubon Center is. We, we purchased a copy of the map at the gift shop. We were just beginning, as I say, research. We had not yet met David Murphy. We didn't know who he was. We didn't know he made the map until we, uh, we found out later. Now the red lines, can you see the red lines okay? You can see the serpentine routes. That's the different routes that the trail took over the years, depending on weather, terrain, whatever they had to face as they, as they went west. You can also see on this map, David took the time to show portions of the Oregon, Mormon, Oxbow, and the Brownville cutoff. Now on the right-hand side, I hope it shows, yeah, it does. You can see winter quarters, Omaha, Nebraska, and then as you work down, you can see uh, Wyoming in relation to Nebraska City. Now we're gonna examine just briefly two portions of the trail in the next couple of slides. This view shows the trail starting in Nebraska City and, and heading west. As you leave Nebraska City toward the setting sun, you pass through the counties of Oto, Lancaster, Seward, and then you reach the Beaver Creek Crossing. Can you see where they come together? Um, that's called the Beaver Creek Crossing, and we'll have some, more, we'll have some actual pictures from 1866 of that crossing, or of the, uh, what was there. So as we go further west, excuse me, that's where you merge at the Beaver Crossing. And you can see on the right-hand side of the image, it blends into almost one trail. There was less of the serpentine uh, routes that they had to take before. Sometimes trying to do old in a new way meets with failure. This is one of the most fascinating parts of the Nebraska City Cutoff Trail or the Steam Wagon Road, as it still says on some maps. In 1862, on the 14th of July, a massive steam-powered machine was unloaded at the Nebraska City levee. 
The contraption weighed almost 10 tons, moved under the power of, listen to this, 10, excuse me, four 10 horsepower engines <laughs> and contained rear wheels that reached over 10 feet in height. The rims measured 18 inches wide. Local residents were, they were almost delirious with the thought of having a steam powered wagon take freight west. Why? Because theoretically, it wouldn't have to stop. They could just keep going. Did I mention it would go almost five miles an hour? <laughs> Twice the speed of oxen? Here's the actual test. With great anticipation, so it was unloaded on the 12th of July. On the 22nd of July, after they had taken this contraption through the streets of Nebraska City and got everybody all excited about it, the 22nd of July, with great fanfare, this steam wagon left Nebraska City for the hope for horizon. Uh, two of the wagons were loaded, had three wagons, excuse me, two were loaded with flour and one was a tinder for the boiler. The apparatus limped out of town, but it was unable to pull anything up the little inclines outside of the hill of Nebraska, outside of the city of Nebraska City. About three miles west of town, so what, 560 miles short of Denver? <laughs> the wagon, the steam wagon just died. A crankshaft broke. Now this was 1862, and that was during the Civil War, so it was, there were no supplies available. The experiment was over, and the steam wagon was never used again. It stayed in that location for a period of time, was eventually picked up. The dream of hauling freight with a giant steam wagon west evaporated into the hot July air. Now, if, you, if you're on what's called the steam wagon road, there's a marker. This is a marker placed at the actual location where the steam wagon uh, died. Now the next slide will show, this is how far outside of town they were. You can see, do you see the trees off in the distance? That's Nebraska City. Well, they even think it's funny out there. So. <laughs> well, this is good. Um, enough on that, I just find it fascinating. And you can, you can Google steam wagon experiment, you can Google steam wagon road, just to learn more about it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about freighting on the trail. A gentleman named DeForest Rolfe, now this is not, this is another freighting wagon train, that's not DeForest Rolfe there with the, uh, uh, what do you call it, bullwhacker whip, but I'm sure she took care of business. Um, on the 10th of January, 1900, this is an amazing story as well. He shared some of his experiences in freighting with a group uh, in Nebraska City. He noted, Rolf noted, that about 7,000 7, pounds of freight could be hauled in a wagon as long as you had 10, uh, five pair, 10 oxen pulling the wagon. Uh, he shared a successful trip he made to Denver in 1862, so shortly after the trail was opened, his wagons were the first to leave Nebraska City uh, that season. He made the trip in 28 days. So you can see if the steam wagon would have worked, the time and the potential money savings that could take place, his payment was $10,000 in Cherry Creek gold dust. Now if you got $10,000 in gold dust, where would you put it? Well, he put his gold dust in two oyster cans. I don't know why he had oyster cans. He did, he put the gold dust in those cans and put them under his uh, saddle and headed west. Uh, two days after he started west, he met up with a war party of Ogallala Sioux who were heading towards some Utes that they wanted to do battle with. After some bantering back and forth and Rolf gave them some tobacco and different things. They departed, uh, as he said, as quickly as they came. Now last night, we had a wonderful presentation on William Henry Jackson. I'm gonna share just a couple of thoughts about him, hopefully to add to that, and to add to the mystique of this amazing 
William Henry Jackson. He is one of the most recognizable people who hired out as a freighter in 1866. It's William Henry Jackson. Years following this experience on the trail, uh, he wrote an autobiography, as we heard last night. Now Jackson and his friends, they arrived in Nebraska City at 2.30 a.m. on the 26th of June, 1866. After they got off the steamboat Denver, he and his two buddies, Rick Rock, excuse me, and Billy, they uh, slept on the steps of doorways until daylight. The freighting wagon train that he and his friends worked for were owned by a gentleman named Matt Ryan. He knew nothing, virtually nothing about the owner of the wagon train, but soon they were officially signed up and whisked off to the company store to purchase outfits. These outfits are interesting. You remember the picture image last night of how William Henry Jackson looked when he arrived in Salt Lake City? Tattered and his clothing was shreds. Well, here's what he started with. A pair of blankets, white rubber coat, shoes, stockings, pants, shirts, an old fashioned carpet bag, a Colt 44 revolver, and a, a supply of cartridges. The total cost for outfitting was $40 and that was subtracted from his $20 monthly allowance. <laughs> now this slide is the crossing of the Platte. This uh, image is found at the L. Tom Perry Special Collections. Um, I just think it's beautiful. So you see this is a, a very familiar item to those who cross the plains. The first morning began, I'm just gonna read it, the first morning began with calls for the new Teamsters to roll out of their beds and prepare for the incoming horde of bulls. The oxen, which Jackson and most of his associates had never yoked up, came thundering into the circular enclosure of wagons. In his own words, I quote, each driver had his own 12 bulls to identify, beginning with the wheelers and then the pointers and swing cattle and the, uh, three yoke, excuse me, and then the leader, six pair in all, each of which had to be yoked and bowed and chained in proper position, unquote. The first morning of yoking required, as we heard last, last night, eight hours to complete. So they didn't travel very far for the first few days because they didn't have any time left. He said during the first few, excuse me, during the first few days, only one drive a day took place and it choked, the freighters choked in the dust on the trail. And he described his first two weeks on the trail as, quote, the severest physical hardship I have ever known. And every day I cursed the folly that had prompted me to throw up my well-shaped career in Vermont, unquote. Each morning during the midnight 1800s, thousands of pioneers and freighters hooked up their livestock, whether it's mules or oxen, and headed west. And we here today are privileged due to the efforts on their part. So 1860, enormous, excuse me again, enormous amounts of freight went through Nebraska City. Now these numbers come from the Nebraska City newspaper. Uh, so whether they're inflated or not, I don't know, but I take them as being accurate. In 1862, nearly 8,000, 8 million pounds of freight left the city. 63, 1863 had about the same volume. 1864 saw a huge jump up to 21 million pounds. When you consider that between four and seven pound, that 7,000 pounds of freight could fit on a wagon, that's a lot of wagons and that's a lot of oxen and a lot of Teamsters. All right, so we're moving on, 1865. I hope this number is astounding to you as, a, as, a, as astounding to you as it is to me. It was a banner year, 44,023,598 pounds of freight moved from Nebraska City. It took f over 4,000 wagons, more than 3,000 men, and 38,850 oxen. Uh, that's a lot of that's a lot, a lot of cooking fuel for the next uh, wagon trains that came west. 
I, I just find it amazing. Um, for everybody that traveled on the planes, weather was always an issue. This is an amazing story too. A, a fellow named Charles Dinney was a traveler on one of the pioneer trains that was heading west. He described one particularly wet day, and I'm gonna quote. In the afternoon, it commenced to rain. Don't you love how matter of fact these guys were as they recorded uh, in their journals? It's just like, uh, okay, another day. Uh, excuse me, in the afternoon it commenced to rain and continued to do so up until dark. It was now bedtime and I had no place to lay my head. The wagon containing 10 persons was too crowded and the ground was soaking wet, unquote. Guess where he slept? He found a place under a wagon for just a brief period of time and then he ended up walking around the rest of the night because it rained all night. It's hard to fathom that, isn't it? Um, what they experienced and went through, the survival uh, that they found. Have many of you, how many of you, raise your hand again. How many of you have heard about Wyoming, Nebraska? Many of you have, okay. It was founded by a gentleman named Jacob Dawson in 26, the 26th of August, 1856. He is not who Dawson County is named after. Uh, some people think that's, he was, but he is not. Um, it's a fascinating story about a man who had an indomitable spirit, but no money. And those two collided, also collided with who he used as his partners. So he was born in Ohio in 1816, and he moved uh, to, after he got married, he moved to Western uh, Iowa, and then across the river to uh, Oto County in 1855. He was, uh, you see the names here? Excuse me, I don't mean to turn away from that. These are the, there's Jacob Dawson, and then his five partners. Let me read about his five partners. Of the six original proprietors, only one, Jacob Dawson, lived in Wyoming. The other five all lived in Nebraska City. The 1856 Nebraska Territorial Census shows Stephen F. Knuckles, he was a banker, Alan A. Bradford, William E. Pardee, and William McClellan, their occupations were attorneys, and John Maxson was a surveyor. Uh, they did not want to have Dawson succeed in Wyoming, because it would mean what? The death of Nebraska City. This faded in image, I, I can't, I don't apologize for it, it's the original plat at the Oto County Courthouse of Jacob Dawson's uh, town. Filed on the, at 10.30 a.m. on the 26th of August, 1856. The signatures of all the, of, of all the prior, proprietors are there now, in Dawson's excitement, this is before everything went downhill, which didn't take long, he thought that Wyoming would rival Nebraska City. The five partners he had lived in Nebraska City, as I said. They did not want him to succeed. One of the partners, the Stephen F. Knuckles, wrote a letter in 1874, and he said just briefly the following about Jacob Dawson and what happened to him. Uh, they purchased the town lots from Dawson, um, but according to Knuckles in his letter, they did not pay much for it, and they didn't. Uh, Dawson had many debts. He was always short of cash. Now this is a, I find it interesting, this is a reproduction of the original plat. Uh, the town that Dawson tried so hard to organize had a park, a public square, all kinds of things for residents to enjoy. There was actually view lots and you'll see in the picture in a minute, view lots on the river that faced the river, uh, whether he thought they were view lots at that point in time or not, I don't know, but he really had a, a mind, a, a very creative mind. So here's where some of the uh, items or businesses were located. Biddleman's Saloon was on the corner of Park and Second, and in the newspaper that Dawson uh, published for a period of time, 
It says that Bittleman fed people oysters every day. I don't know what it is about oysters in Nebraska, uh, but I guess people ate them. <laughs> so there's a wagon repair shop, as you can see there, and then a blacksmith shop. Um, it thrived for about two years, and then it just simply died. Jacob advertised for 50 day laborers and carpenters, and then he said in the Nebraska, his newspaper, uh, the Wyoming Post, those who want a good lo location had better hurry up. For a little bit, the town, excuse me, the town supported um, a, a school, a church, a three-story warehouse, a newspaper office, and home for the residents. In addition, there was a ferry that would take people from across the Missouri River from Iowa to actually to Wyoming. This is a picture of the road that currently leads down to where the levee uh, was. It's now a place where people enjoy their summers. Um, a poll tax was issued in 1859 for people who lived in Wyoming. They either had to work on the levee and fix it or repair wood, the wood road, W-O-O-D road, which led down to the, to the river. That was their choices. So this is the levee as it looks today. Uh, as you can see, there's mobile homes there and people go there to enjoy uh, the river, which isn't there. They, they're, they're, it's not even close. You'll see that in just a couple of minutes. The levee, pardon me, it was a natural levee, and it actually ran 260 feet in length and 160 feet deep. It was superior to the Nebraska City levee, and it was natural. So this is a recent view of Wyoming, Nebraska territory. Now the farmer who owns this, it's been terraced, and you can see those there. The, the Missouri River is totally out of the picture on the right-hand side. It's probably hard to visualize, but can't you almost see the roads going through this town? There is a lady named Mrs. Emma McCarthy. She moved there with her family in 1857 when the town was actually thriving for a bit. She remembers a stage passing through the town that ran from St. Joseph, Missouri to Omaha, and it would go back and forth. This view is looking east. You can see the Missouri River now. And it gives you an idea of how high above the river this town sat. Now, one more photo of the town site, a little further north from the previous one. You can see the Missouri River better. Uh, Emma McCarthy's sister, Anna, remembered the time in the village when lots of Mormons were there, as she called them. Uh, as they would dock at the town levee, here's her recollection. She remembers Swedes, Danes, Germans, and French parading up and down the little town in great numbers. So Anna, her recollection of those times would have been in 1864. The town of Wyoming did establish a cemetery. This is what's left. Due to vandalism, the cemetery is about a mile and a half out of town. It's on the farm that was farmed uh, by Jim Johnson. And, but this is all that's left. Due to vandalism, they would take, uh, also take these tombstones and use them to, to block ditches when they needed to move water. So it's really impossible to know who's buried in that cemetery uh, other than these uh, partial um, stones that are here. Fortunately, I want to read this. The Jim and Harold Johnson family, that's who lives on the property, along with the John Watts Barrett Family Genealogical Organization, placed this marker six tenths of a mile from the actual site as a way to remember those who passed through there. Now I'm going to conclude today's little presentation talking about some migrations that actually went through the village of Wyoming, Nebraska during the years 1846, excuse me, 1864 to 1866. I'm gonna back up a little bit. This is a picture of, of some, obviously it's a wagon trains. In 1860, Brigham Young announced the formation of a revolutionary uh, new plan to bring people and freight to the Utah Territory. Many, most of the immigrants 
who uh, went through the years 1864 to 1866 to Utah came from uh, Europe. There was one group that actually came from South Africa. This bold move to take, to, to bring people and freight to the Utah Territory, uh, it helped reduce costs. Uh, it presented opportunities uh, to freight items from Utah back to the Missouri River and bring the people to Europe. Young suggested that the church would send teams from Utah to the outfitting stations on the banks of the Missouri River, pick up the waiting immigrants and return to Utah that same year. Local church leaders would be asked, strongly asked, to donate needed supplies, oxen, mules, uh, wagons, and men uh, to work as Teamsters to complete the 2200 mile round trip. President Young stated, I'll quote, if we can go with our teams to the Missouri River and back in one season and bring the poor, their provisions, etc., it will save about half of the cash we now expend to bring saints to this point from Europe. So here's just a really quick review, and then we're going to get into some actual pictures taken by Charles Savage in a, the Cross Plains migration that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, 1864, just under 3,000 immigrants traveled out of Wyoming. And you gotta remember, they came here and they had to camp. All right, so this is an image. All of this comes from History, Nebraska. Okay, so this is, this is Wyoming, Nebraska territory as it looked in 1866. So let's move uh, to the next one. This shows what they stayed in during their short stay in Wyoming. This is called the Cheese Creek Ranch. Again, taken by Charles Savage. They had road houses on the cutoff trail for people to rest. It was called the Cheese Creek Ranch because they made and sold cheese. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many would be comfortable buying cheese here? <laughs> okay, we're going west. This is a, just a rut from the Audubon Center that I mentioned to you earlier, okay? This is fascinating. This is the Roland Reed Ranch. Um, again, Charles Savage took this photograph. It's the only known cross plains migration but photography that took place uh, during the whole migration period, according to uh, John Carter, I believe, in the article he wrote. Uh, okay, so that's the Roland Reed Ranch. This is where the Roland Reed Ranch was. I don't know if you can see the word house. That's where the ranch stood. And this is the Beaver Creek Crossing. Remember I referred to that just a bit ago? Let's go to the next slide. So Dick Parasat drove us out, it's on his property, he drove us out to this site so we could take a picture. This is going into Beaver Creek Crossing, and then the next slide says, shows it coming out on the other side. It's just fascinating. If you love trails, everybody here does. These are amazing pictures. Okay, so let's go, next is Fort Kearney. We're past the cutoff trail now, but we're heading west still. Uh, this is a picture of Fort Kearney in 1866. August 3rd, uh, Savage took this picture in a windstorm and he wasn't very satisfied with the outcome. We're still moving west. This is O'Fallon's Bluff, very famous uh, location in the, in the Platte River on the right-hand side. This is cross, crossing the Platte River near Hershey, Nebraska. You notice how these wagons are being pulled? With mules. Charles Savage had his own special wagon and he traveled with the Thomas Ricks wagon train and they used mules. He's heading west. We're all familiar with the Scots, or Scots Bluff, excuse me, Chimney Rock. Uh, really appreciate the fact that the History of Nebraska has these photos. There's other Charles Savage photos uh, as well. Um, now we're gonna close quickly with, oh, that's Salt Lake City in 1866. Okay. Let's go to the last slide, Marilyn. That's it. Do old in a new way. I really appreciate you being here.